My name is Walid Isa. I came to the United States of America in December 2006. I am uh, from Palestine. I was born in Bethlehem. Every moment was a very special memory to me. Growing up in a refugee camp, I uh, realized that every moment I lived in that refugee camp, there was some new excitement and some new memory um, uh, that I carried with me from my childhood. I was born with five sisters and three brothers. I'm number eight in the family. Um, we shared uh, food. We shared happiness. We shared compassion. As much as we were poor when it comes to money, but we were very rich when it comes to love and compassion. Um, being number eight, living with five siblings, eight siblings, um, uh, I really, you know, my, my life was uh, full of memories um, that shaped and crafted uh, the way I look at my life today. Uh, my grandfather became a refugee in 1948. My grandmother and my grandfather, when the war outbreak in, the in, in Jerusalem in 1948, they, they left to come to Bethlehem. Uh, and in the way to Bethlehem, my grandmother gave a birth to her first son in a small, a small cave outside Bethlehem. And I'm not talking about Jesus here. This is my dad. Um, I celebrated my sweet 16 in the second intifada. I was born in the first intifada. When I was 16 years old, I was in the old city in Bethlehem in a coffee shop with some of my friends. My school teacher and his daughter, they were coming towards the coffee shop. Um, I loved my school teacher. He taught me most of the morality and values that I have today. I ran outside of the coffee shop to grow, greet my school teacher and his daughter. Suddenly, from the other side of the road, a big white van came and big scary men jumped out of the white van and start showering my school teacher. Teacher's car with bullets. At that moment, I ran back to the coffee shop and I started peering from the window. The scary men left in less than a minute and the street became silent. I ran outside to go see what happened to George and Christina. Um, what happened to my school teacher and his daughter. Um, but as a 16 years old, I could not do anything but wipe the blood with my white shirt and scream as big, as, as, as hard as I can. At that moment, I stopped looking at the Holy Land as a Holy Land. There is nothing holy about a place where you cannot actually save the people's life. All I wanted to do is find big, scary AK-47 and revenge. Um, my dad came and he took me home. And he realized the amount of anger and frustration that was built in my heart slowly. He wanted to save me uh, from allow extremism take me away from him. He sent me to a school that focused on nonviolence. And through my school, I was accepted in a program called Arc for Peace, where they bring Palestinians, Native Americans, African Americans to Minnesota, to St. Paul, for three weeks. And that's when the first time I came to Minneapolis, to Minnesota. Uh, I lived here for two weeks. I lived with an American family. Then I went back home. After I finished my high school, my American mom from Minnesota called me to ask me, what's the top three choices? Where's the Harvard of the Middle East that you want to go to? There was no choices for me. I was not going to go to college. Uh, we did not have enough resources to go to college. My American mom generously, she helped me come to, Min to Minnesota and she paid for my first year of college, and that's how I came to the United States of America. I went to Normandale Community College, um, and I, uh, then I went to St. Cloud State University. I finished my undergraduate school in uh, economics, and then I finished my graduate school in applied economics, and then I did a negotiation program at the Harvard Law School. Um, and today, I am who I am because of a very generous Minnesotan who actually cared to heal me, to heal my soul, and accept me as a member of their family, um, and allow me to thrive. Uh, my identity is not a static. It's a dynamic. It's changing based on the people and the cultures 
and the places that I relate myself to. And today, my identity, after 10 years living here, is shaped by the generosity of Minnesota and by the values of my family that I grew up in the refugee camp. It's very hard to describe what does a refugee camp means. It's very hard to describe what does a refugee status mean, not in terms of physical space, in terms of psychological space. Uh, it's impossible for me to allow my deep emotions and my feelings uh, to describe what does it mean to be a refugee. I hated the fact that I was a refugee. Um, I hated the fact that I need to speak a certain language or learn about a certain religion to eat three times a day. I hate the concept of foreign aid. Um, I, don't win, I do not want a handout, I want a hand up. Uh, it was dehumanizing for me to see lines of people waiting online to get um, a simple meal to feed their family. Um, look, in America here, they say you could give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. You could teach him to fish and he will eat for the rest of his life. All I wanted when I was in the refugee camp, I do not want people to teach me how to fish. I did not want people to give me fish. All I asked for is an opportunity. is an opportunity for myself to go fishing on my own understanding and my own authentic voice. And I am here today in Minnesota because I believe the generosity of the people in Minnesota and my deep connection um, to the art, the music, the leadership is making me very proud to be here today. And I'm confident that the tiny ripples of hope that John F. Kennedy talked about still exist and very strong uh, in Minnesota. The, de the demography in Minnesota is changing, and I see it every single day. I am very connected with many minority groups in Minnesota. Um, you know, social scientists tell us that our ability to connect with people who are different than us uh, help us shape our tolerance and our ability to thrive in our workplace. Minnesota's population is shifting, but it's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. Um, it makes it more interesting and more fascinating. I love the fact that we have different cultures and different ethnicities living around us. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, the different shapes and different cultures, they can create a very beautiful piece of art that will attract millions of people from around the world to come to Minneapolis and come to, to, to Minnesota. Um, look, I want to have a family one day, hopefully in Minnesota. And I want to have a daughter, and I want to tell my daughter that there is leadership that stood to the right thing in the right time. I want to tell her about the governor's letter to John Kerry standing for uh, refugees, for Syrian refugees. I want to tell her about the lieutenant governor who is walking from a place to place trying to find ways to connect minorities. I want to tell her about the leadership we have here. And also I want to have a son and I want to tell him about the Humphrey and what he have actually provided to this country. Um, we have so many people here who are different cultures, different ethnicities. And I hope one day we will not only talk about tolerance, we will also talk about hospitality. We will not only talk about diversity, we will also talk about actually pluralism and our ability to connect with one, each, with one, with one, one, with one and another. But you know what? I feel very lucky. Because my grandfather, when he became a refugee, he closed the door to his house and he brought the key with him. He showed me the key. You know, my life and my self-worth uh, was measured by my ability to create a meaning for my grandfather's key and my father and myself. When I went to classes, I did not define my self-worth and my ability to success by finding a good paid job or by a grade C or A or B. My self-worth and my success is measured 
by my ability to find the meaning to the gra my grandfather's key and my grandfather's story. Um, but I feel very lucky because I got to touch and see the key that shaped my self-worth and my success story. But each one of us today has that key. You could have it, she could have it, everybody would have it. It could be your sexuality, it could be your religion, it could be your ethnicity. And what our role today is to help people find the key and allow the key to be uh, a way uh, to create a path for a hopeful future, for a better future. We cannot allow, we cannot afford to allow that key to be uh, the determination for us to go for destructive methods to kill our society. Um, the key that shapes your identity, your self-worth, is very important to recognize. So you can actually create a meaning out of that key and not let it destruct, to be destructive to you and your society. Exactly, which is that's why I always tell students and I told, always tell my friends that you know your success or your self worth is not determined by your grades, is not determined by your car. It's a mix between the relationships you create, and the music, the culture, the art, and also the education that you actually gain from school. Our self worth uh, is is actually the trust and the relationships that we create in our society, also the education level we get from school. We cannot separate any from the other. And our identity is always shifting. It's a dynamic, it's not a static thing. It's changing based on our ability to create meanings and uh, grow our self-worth. It's important to realize that. Look, in every place in the world, wherever you go, there is bad rotten apples and there is very good apples. Uh, Minnesota here, we have both. We have mixed people. When I went to St. Cloud State University, I was a, a target to a hate crime. Some kids, they thought it would be funny to call me a racist name and hit me in the back of my head with, head with a rock. I woke up in the emergency room telling me that they're going to do an MRI. At that moment, I was terrified, scared. I ran away from the refugee camp because I do not want to be around violence, not because I'm looking for a welfare or money. Um, at that moment in the emergency room, uh, I was terrified and scared, and I did not believe that it's the place where the most generous people exist. They help me be who I am. Also, there is the most awful people exist. At the same time, at that semester, when I went to St. Cloud, uh, my grades fall were very bad, and I did not see the value of going to school. I was scared to go to classes. Uh, but because of the generosity of my professors, from the president of St. Cloud State University to the gen gen janitor at the St. Cloud State University, they used to call me by my name and welcome me and smile my face. They brought the confidence back that I will actually make a difference. My experience and that accident pushed me every single day to work hard, to graduate and prove uh, that we can make uh, my life better and Minnesota better. I will revenge <laughs> by the people who hit me by actually uh, do my best to connect with people in Minnesota and serve the people in Minnesota and to show them that we are actually one. When we say we are one, we mean it. And I will not let the rotten apples decide or dictate my experience in Minnesota. I will always look for the generous people that they help me, that they shape my identity to be around me and shape the future of my life. We all know that fear is very toxic, but also we all know that hope is very strong. Hope is the only feeling that is stronger than fear. If you do not believe me, ask a Syrian refugee in the middle of the sea waiting to get to Europe. I am hopeful that I will not let fear and rotten apple toxic my future life. You know, every single day we hear different messages. Um, 
you know, when a Syrian kid says, I want, you, I want your, uh, I want you to allow your humanity to get over your toxic nationalistic fear, he means it. When a Palestinian kid, he says, I want a two country to live in a first class, class citizen, he means it. When a young girl asks to be treated, to dream, to believe that she can be, she means it. Uh, how can we hear these messages? What's our role? Um, when a Jewish kid says, uh, you know, anti-Semitic is real and I don't want you to, I want you to welcome me as a human and not be an anti-Semite. Anti he means it. Our role is how to hear that messages carefully in Minnesota. Um, to listen and allow our humanity and our uh, ability to help these kids to get over our toxic fear. We cannot let fear determine the equation and who we are. We must let hope and our ability to connect with each other as humans determine who we are. We are, we are here. We are part of the society. Right. We care. Right. We're going to build this place. We're going to take our, our, our lead. Right. Uh, we are not disconnected from here. Uh, at this point, I feel very Minnesotan. You know, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> you know, people don't understand that when I go back home, I spend most of the, my time defending Minnesota and defending America. I feel it's very important for me to explain what is Kate who's helping me. That's, that's what Minnesota is. It's not the toxic fear that you hear from news. You know, when I come here, I feel like I spend most of my time trying to explain to people what, who we are as a refugees. It's exhausting. It's exhausting, but you know, we cannot, we cannot give up. You know, Humphrey said, you know, we're not giving in, we're not giving up. We're gonna keep, keep going. Uh, and it's also, <coughs> you know, Minnesota has the ability to be, you know, the, the place where example for the rest of the world to follow. Our legislators and our leaders, they should act on it. Um, we have to build trust and build relationships to continue as a society. We cannot let divide decide who we are. It's a very special place. It's a very special place, especially, you know, and also we have to, 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 to work really hard to keep it special. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's amazing. We have so many artists, so many music, and uh, uh, outside Washington, D.C., Minnesota, have the, m uh, the, n the most number of uh, museums, museums per capita, actually. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> look, I honestly uh, think it's a great place, but again, I think, you know, we have to listen carefully to each other. We have to connect with one, o one, w with one another. Um, if a fam, if a, if, you know, um, look to me personally, it's not acceptable that we have a huge gradu different graduating rate between different communities in Minnesota. When an African, yes, when an African American kid uh, begged for his hopes and dreams not to be shattered in the street, we have to listen carefully. And I feel my role as a Minnesotan to listen and try to help, whether it's an Asian American, or it's an African American, or it's a Palestinian American, or an American Palestinians, we have to listen to each other. Uh, it's very, very important. So I have my brother, two of my, bro two of my brothers are in Florida, um, and the rest of my family are actually back home. And, uh, Three of my sisters, they are married, actually living in the refugee camp. Uh, so in 2009, my brother, he was diagnosed with cancer in the refugee camp. Um, so basically, they told him, you don't have the resources to treat you. Brother, we're going to die in the refugee camp. Here I am, 1,000 miles away from my brother, who was diagnosed with cancer, and there is no treatment for him. Uh, I was very frustrated and very angry, and again, I find a Minnesotan family help me uh, 
And my American mom, she's amazing. She did a fundraising to raise money for my brother. We raised money and we brought my brother here and he went to the hospital. Um, and he became cancer free. Um, and you know, he's again, he has a, a small tumor, but we were, we're, we're determined that we're gonna continue and gonna help him. That's how my brother, he came to the States actually. Uh, so you can see about how much Minnesota changed and affected my, my life. <laughs> uh, that's why I started the American Palestinian Hope Project. Uh, because we have very talented people overseas in the refugee camp. And also we have uh, a great people over here. I'm determined to continue to build bridges between people so they can get to know each other and we can actually show the real image of what is Minnesota, what is Americans, to, to the average Palestinian, and also to allow my community and the people around me to understand what does it mean to be a Palestinian, what does it mean to be in a, living in a refugee camp. Uh, I think it's very important to build relationship, to build trust within the society, and also with other sides of the world.